Hey, Tyson here from Refuge Church in Lenore City, Tennessee. Thank you for listening to our message today. Refuge Church is a family of faith sent to proclaim hope in Jesus Christ through relationships. For more resources and information about Refuge, please visit us on the web at refugeph.com. All right, we are going to be in uh, Acts chapter 4, Acts chapter 15. 2 Timothy 4 and John 15. So put your finger in all those places, if you would. Uh, We've been going through the book of Acts. We've been talking about (coughs) what it means to be the church. And and when we we, we started the book of Acts January of last year, so we've chopped that thing up into a bunch of little pieces. And when we do that, sometimes we lose sight of those overall themes through the book. So as we end up in the book of Acts, we want to cover a lot of those themes. I'm calling them the threads of Acts. And we've looked at a lot of things. One of the things we're going to look at today is this idea of community. Now we've spent a lot of time as we went through the book of Acts looking at what it means to be a church and fellowship. And we think about the church and how it was started. And Jesus gave them this command in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, that they will be witnesses, right? That he's going to pour out his spirit on them. They'll receive power and they'll be witnesses. And then for 10 days, this group of 120 believers prayed desperately for God to send his spirit. And then in Acts chapter 2, Pentecost, the day of Pentecost comes, and God pours out his spirit on this group of believers Other people come and check out what's going on, and they come and put their faith in Jesus Christ. And it said thousands of people, 3,000 people were added to the church. And then we get to Acts chapter 2, verse 42, and it says that this group of believers, they were devoted. It says they were devoted to the apostles' teaching, they were devoted to the breaking of bread, they were devoted to prayer, they were devoted to fellowship. And then we see in the rest of Acts chapter 2, that, that they're so devoted to each other and this idea of community that they begin to uh, give away their things to meet other people's needs. And we see that really throughout the book of Acts. We see the church giving. We see them living life together. And if you really think about it in this idea of community, this church that was founded on Jesus Christ, the entire culture around them was hostile to them. Obviously, the Jewish religion was hostile to them. Acts chapter 6, they killed one of the followers of Jesus because he was uh, proclaiming Jesus. So, so the world around them was hostile, which I think brought them closer together, right? So we spent a lot of time talking about that kind of community, the, the, the church community, church family. What I want to talk about today is to take that a step farther and talk about Christian friendship. That inside the community of the church, and it may not just be this church, it may be the big C church, you, you may be really close friends with somebody who goes to a different church. But, but the idea is, is that you as a Christian should have close Christian friends, right? You should have people that are close to you. So as we look at the book of Acts, if you're a visitor with us, we would love for you to have a copy of our sermon notes. You can text your uh, the word visit to that number right there, 865-276-8686. You'll be given a little digital connection card, and then you'll be sent a link. You can follow along with us. If you're a regular at Refuge, you need that. Uh, if you don't have that, you text the word Refuge to that number, and you get it every week. But if you don't have it, I've got a little challenge for you at the end. So you're going to need that link to be part of that challenge. Or you could just say something to me on the way out. I'll put you on the list. Okay. So, this idea of Christian community, this idea of Christian friendship, have you, have you ever heard this statement? Show me who your friends are and I will show you your future. If, if you want to understand the character of a man and it's not clear, look at his friends. And maybe you said this to your teenager, you become who you hang with. Right? Teenagers, or if you're a parent of a teenager, you say that all the time. One of the most important decisions that a teenager makes is who they choose as their friends. Because it impacts who we become, right? Who, who is in our inner circle matters. Well, listen, if, if we preach that to our teenagers, that it's important who's in your inner circle, does that not true for us as well as adults? I mean, sometimes I think that we think we're more mature, which is laughable. 
Uh, we think we're more mature and we can handle it, right? That, that I won't be influenced by them. Maybe I, can, maybe I can rub off on them, right? But that's not always true. Who our friends are matter. Well, let me tell you what our mission statement is here at Refuge. Refuge Church is a family of faith sent to proclaim hope in Jesus Christ through relationships, right? The idea is family of faith, community, church, living life together, and then we want to share hope to others by developing relationships with them. Now, here's what happens. For us to be able to share hope with people, we have to build relationships with people who don't think like us, who don't view Jesus Christ in the world like us, and let's be honest, who may not have the same morals and thought process that we have. So, so how do we fulfill our mission of being friends with people so we can influence them for the, with the hope of Jesus Christ and not let that impact who we become? Well, I want you to think about this in the idea of three circles. But before I get to this idea of three circles, I want you to think about uh, Jesus preaches this sermon in Matthew. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. And he starts off and he talks about the, the Beatitudes. Blessed be this, blessed are those, you know, you, you know those things. And then he says this statement in Matthew chapter 5. He says, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill. You, you don't hide a lamp. You don't light a lamp and then hide it. You put it up where people can see it. And then he says, you are the salt of the earth. Now let me ask you this question. Does darkness influence light? Can you go home today and turn on the darkness? No. Darkness doesn't influence light. Light influences darkness. If you, if you had a bunch of salt and you put meat on it, are you trying to influence the salt to taste like meat? Is that going to work? No. See, salt influences what you put it on. And to see, this is the idea that Jesus is trying to get us to think about in the start of this sermon is that we are called to impact the world around us, not to have the world impact us. So how do we do that, right? Let's go back to these three circles. All of us have this large circle of people that we know. These are people we know their names. These are people that uh, we know a little bit about them. Maybe they're people that we don't hang out with, <coughs> but we know them. We see them out, you know, how's the weather? Tennessee's horrible. You know, who's going to be the quarterback this year? All those things, right? Just surface level stuff. We all have a big group of circle. And then we have this, this maybe this middle circle that I call it. These are people that we know more personally. These are people that we may hang out with at times. These are people <coughs> that we know a lot about and they know a lot about us. Maybe it's people that we hang out with because of our kids and their friends. Or, or it's just people that we know. But then we also have this inner circle of friends. And these are people that we let speak into our lives. Right? These are people that we know a lot about. These are people that we speak into their lives. Right? We all have these friends that if, it's, if you're broke down on the side of the interstate and you, you need some help, you can call them. Right? We, we all have friends like that. Uh, you want to find out who your, your real friends are? Rent a U-Haul. <laughs> right? It's time to move, and you want to call and see who your friends are. That's the best test. You know, somebody calls you and they're like, hey, man, I got to move. Like, will you help me move? Man, look, bro, I, I farm worms, and, uh, man, I got I to gotta work on that. Well, I hadn't even told you the date. Yeah, I mean, really the next six months, I'm booked up, right? See, that's how you find out who your friends are. But, but let's be honest, right? Lost people have friends like that. Lost people have friends that they can call when they're in a bind. But here's the real question. When your work is falling apart, your life is falling apart, you get that call from the doctor, your marriage is falling apart, do you have somebody you can call and say, hey, will you pray for me? That's the kind of friend that I'm talking about. Do you have somebody in your circle like that? Statistically, here's what you'll find. Women, by and large, they have people like that in their lives. Men, not so much. We have the guys that we can call to help us move, fix a tire, do whatever. But by and large, do we have people we, who speak into our lives who are Christians who we can say, listen, man, I, 
I need to speak with you about this. Nobody knows this. Not even my wife knows this. Do you have people like that in your life? Women, do you have people like that in your life that are in that inner circle? Because it matters. So that's the idea that I want us to think about in this thread in the book of Acts is the idea of this band of brothers and sisters, this your posse, your gang, my boys, these are my girls, right? Who, this is who I run with. This is who shaped me into who I am. These are the people that, that speak into my life and who I speak into their life, and, and, and it's a close relationship. That's what I want to talk about today. Now, in the book of Acts, we could pick several people. Paul and Silas were really close friends. Peter and John did ministry together and were friends. But I'm going to choose a guy. His name's Barnabas. And I, I think as we look at the picture of Barnabas in Scripture, we're going to see what a true Christian friend is like. And, and as we look at this, these couple of passages about Barnabas, what I want you to do is I want you to, first of all, think, am I that kind of friend to somebody else? And second of all, do I have a friend like that in my life? And I'll show you why it's important here in a moment. Acts chapter 4. Um, I've given up. I've went to the glasses. It is what it is. <coughs> Acts chapter 4, starting in verse 36. It says, Let all of the house of Israel therefore know for certain. I'm in the wrong chapter. It's not the right verse. Here we go. It says, Thus Joseph, who is... Uh, was called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So here we have this guy named Joseph. And they gave him a nickname. Now, we had nicknames for guys I went to school with. Most of it cannot be repeated in this room, right? You, you give somebody a nickname for a reason. It, it, it makes you think of them in some way. Maybe they, you know, did something wrong or whatever, right? You think about whatever that nickname is. But they gave this nickname to this guy, Joseph, because it reflected his character and who he is. And his nickname was Barnabas, which means he's an encourager, one who comes alongside, one who comforts, one who... Uh, consoles people is the idea of this word encourager and this is what he was known as and, and this introduction to him he literally sells his property to give to the community to meet their needs an encourager that's the kind of guy that he is and if, if, you, if we were to go a little bit farther in scripture uh, if, if you've been with us and you've been through the book of Acts you recognize the name Paul or Saul his name started as Saul. They changed his name to Paul. Saul was a guy who persecuted Christians. Literally, in, we're in Acts chapter 4. In Acts chapter 6 and 7, a guy named Stephen comes onto the scene. He's full of the Holy Spirit. He preaches this gospel message. And as a result, they throw rocks at him until he dies. And the ringleader was the guy named Saul, Paul. He's the one that ordered it. Not only that, Paul decides, hey, listen, I, I, on my own, I'm going to go to these religious leaders and I'm going to ask them for these letters and I'm going to go to all these cities because what happened is when Stephen was killed, the church scattered. And Paul said, I'm going after them. I'm chasing them. Whatever city they go to, I'm going after them. So he asked for these letters and he began, he wanted to go to these towns and he wanted to find these people who were Christians and he wanted to arrest them and bring them back to Jerusalem. And in Acts chapter 9, Paul starts down the road to Damascus, and he encounters Jesus Christ. Galatians tells us that, that Jesus himself shared the gospel with Paul. And Paul uh, is converted. He's born again right there. Gives his heart and life to Jesus Christ. Uh, the, the Lord sends a man named Ananias to him. This, this experience that Paul had, it blinded him. He couldn't see. And he said, I want you to go to this town and wait. So the people that were with him took him to this town. And then the Lord said, hey, Ananias, I want you to go to this guy named Paul. And Ananias said, whoop, time out. I've heard about him. He's dangerous. And the Lord said, listen, he's a chosen instrument of mine. So Ananias obeys the Lord. He goes to Paul. He lays hands on him. His sight is restored. He's baptized. And Paul begins to go around telling people about Jesus. Well, Paul decides he wants to go back to Jerusalem where Stephen was killed where he ordered it. 
And the church is like, ooh, time out. You know, for God so loved the world, but I don't know about Paul. You, you don't know what Paul did. I, Paul killed one of our own. They, they were not interested in letting Paul in. You know who stood up for Paul in Acts chapter 9? Barnabas. Barnabas came alongside Paul and vouched for his character and vouched for his transformed life. And, and from that moment on, Paul and Barnabas became friends. They began to do ministry together. The church began to send them out to do ministry, to, to go on these mission trips, and they live life together. And as they're living life together and sharing in this friendship, this guy joins them, and his name is John Mark. And, and they've got this little band of brothers, and they're walking around to these other towns telling people about Jesus. Paul's life has changed. Barnabas, they're, they're latched onto each other. It's, it's a close friendship. Well, something happens with this guy named John Mark, and he quits. The Bible says that he turned back. He left. We're going to look in, in Acts chapter 15, and, and Paul basically says he, he didn't do the work. He quit. John Mark's a quitter. So let's pick it up in Acts chapter 15 and see what happens. Acts chapter 15, starting in verse 36. It says, After some days Paul said to Barnabas, Let us return and visit the brothers in every city where we proclaimed the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. So they've been all over these missionary journeys, and they want to go back and visit all these churches that they've started to see how things are going. Verse 37. Now Barnabas wanted to take with him John called Mark. This is the guy that left him. This is the guy that quit. He's a quitter. He doesn't have it in him. But Barnabas, the encourager, the one who stood up for Paul, is now standing up for John Mark. One mistake doesn't destroy you in Barnabas' eyes. Look what happens. But Paul thought best not to take them, not to take with them the one who had withdrawn from him, from them in Pamphylia, and had not gone with them to the work. And there arose a sharp disagreement, so that they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and departed, having been commanded by the brothers to the grace of the Lord, and he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening churches. Now, Paul and Barnabas are friends. They still are at this moment. We read in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6, <coughs> how they still do ministry together. This didn't divide their friendship. This doesn't have anything to do with the sermon. But do you know that you can disagree with somebody and still be friends? I mean, that's actually possible. You don't have to listen to the news that says we have to hate each other. You don't have to agree with people to be their friend. Matter of fact, just turn the news off. You'll be better off. Right? But here's the idea. This Barnabas guy is standing up for the quitter. And, and, and these two good friends are in sharp disagreement over the character of John Mark. That's all that's in question here. They both share the same gospel. They both share the same mission. They both share the same love. They both want to do the same work. But Paul says, listen, that guy's a quitter. I'm not letting him go with me. And Barnabas says, I've got him. He can go with me. Now, I want you to picture if this had turned out differently. What if this story had turned out differently? Think about it. Paul quickly rose to be one of the primary leaders in the church. Matter of fact, from this point on, the focus used to be on Peter and John and those guys. From this point on, the, the focus begins to be on Paul and Silas. The rest of the book of Acts is really about them. We don't really see much else about Barnabas and John Mark in this, in this letter. So Paul is like one of the primary leaders. What if Barnabas would have said, you know what, Paul, you're right. You're one of the leaders of this group. I trust your judgment. Uh, we'll just do that. We'll just leave John Mark behind and we'll go. Very well could have happened. Could have been us that made that decision, but not Barnabas. He said, I want, Barn I want John Mark to go, and if nobody else will go with him, I'll go with him. And see, that's the idea. That's what a true friend is. An English publication offered a prize for the best definition of a friend. 
They got thousands of entries, right? There's a prize on the line. Here's just a couple. A friend is one who multiplies joy and divides grief. I think that's a great definition. Multiplies joy and divides grief. One who understands our silence. Right? It takes a true friend to understand silence. J- just this week, f- Friday, I got one of those emails that like pukes on your weekend, right? It's just, here you go. Have a good weekend, right? And, and as soon as we get home, Shelly's like, I could tell something was wrong with you. She could tell in my silence that something's wrong. True friends can read our silence. One of the other ones was, uh, a watch which beats true for all time and never runs out. Right? A, a true friend never quits. They never run out. They're always a friend, and they're always on time. But the winner was this. A friend is one who comes in when the whole world has gone out. We think about this idea of John Mark. The whole world had walked out. Paul, when he became a Christian, guess what? All his Jewish friends... All his elite friends that he had grown up with and studied with, they all hated him at this point. Now that even the church that he had joined to become a part of were scared of him. When the whole world had walked out, who walked in? Barnabas. See, that's what a true friend is. When the whole world walks out, a friend walks in. So here's the question. What happened to John Mark? How does his story end? Well, we don't hear a lot about him until we get to 2 Timothy. Turn over to 2 Timothy chapter 4. By the way, Timothy is in Paul's circle. Timothy is a disciple of Paul. He's in his inner circle. He took Timothy, young man Timothy under his wing. He had written him these two letters. We get to read them today, 2,000 years later. We get to see about this Christian friendship if you want to study more about Christian friendship, read First and Second Timothy because it's a friend speaking into the life of another friend. And here's the thing about Timothy, Second Timothy. This is Paul's last letter. Paul knows he's about to die. Matter of fact, on, on that road in Damascus, when the Lord spoke to Ananias, he said, I want you to go to Paul for I'm going to show him how much he must suffer for my name. So Paul knew that his life was going to be nothing but suffering because of his following Jesus Christ. And if you read the story, it is. Shipwrecked, beaten, they threw rocks at him till they thought he was dead. All these things, Paul's life always was on the run. And now he thinks his life's over. You can see the urgency in this letter. He's like, Timothy, I need you to get here quickly. And I want you to bring some things. If you were to read on past where we're going to read, he says, I want you to bring my, my parchments, bring the scriptures, bring my letters, because it's about over. But look at what he says. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 9. He says, Do your best to come to me soon, for Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Christians has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Luke alone is with me. He says, Listen, I'm here by myself. It's just Luke and I. Everybody else is gone. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is very useful to my ministry. That's John Mark. The one that Paul didn't have confidence in. The one that Paul said, no, he can't go with us. All of a sudden, at the end of Paul's ministry, he says, listen, I can't live without this guy, John Mark. I need him here with me. Now think about the turn that took place in the life of John Mark. Go go back to that moment in Acts chapter 15. What if Barnabas would have said, you're right, Paul, let's leave him behind, let's move on, let's pick somebody else. Sorry, John Mark. What would have happened to John Mark? This right here probably would not have happened. Here we see at the end of Paul's life, Him seeing the value in Mark. And why did he see the value in Mark? Because Mark had a friend that when the whole world walked out, he walked in. See, friends impact our lives. They determine our destination. Who who we let speak into our lives matters. So let me ask you a question. Who are you allowing to impact your life? 
Better yet, who are you impacting with your life and what kind of impact is it? Are, are you being salt and light? Do you, do you have people in your life who are being salt and life, light into your life? Do you have people who, who uh, speak Christian things, in, Christian wisdom, godly wisdom into your life? Because it matters. And, and here's the question that I think we have to ask. Do, do we have people in this inner circle that maybe just need to be in the middle circle? Yeah, we're still friends with them. Yeah, we still hang out. But I'm not going to allow them to speak into my life because they don't have the same values and, and view the world the way I do. And, and, and maybe you have people in that middle circle that do view things the way you should, and maybe they should be moved into your inner circle. It's not that we have the wrong friends, right? right? The Lord wants us to be friends with all, all kinds of people, share the gospel with people. The question is, are the friends in the wrong circle? Who, who are we allowing to speak into our lives because it matters? There's an artist, his name is Albrecht Durer. Probably never heard of him, um, but he's world famous. As a child, all he wanted to do was paint. He wanted to be an artist. So much so that even as a child, he told his parents, he said, listen, I want to go to this school in this other town and become an artist. So when he got old enough, he left his family, and he went to this other town to join this school to be an artist. And while he was there, he met this friend. We don't even know the friend's name, but he met this friend who had the same dream. They both wanted to go to the same school and be an artist. So <coughs> they decided to live together. And go to school. So they would work a little bit, go to school a little bit. Did the best they could. And it really wasn't working out for them. So Albrecht Durer's friend came to him and said, Listen, here's what I would like to do. Albrecht, you go to school full time. And I'll work full time. And then when your art begins to sell and you can support, then I'll quit work and then I'll go to school. And Albrecht said, I'm not interested in that at all. Finally, after much convincing, Albrecht said, okay, that's what we'll do. So his friend went to work full-time. Albrecht went to school to become an artist, to live out his dream, what he'd always wanted to do. His friend put his dream on hold so Albrecht could reach his. So finally, Albrecht finishes school, and he begins to sell some art, and he begins to have some income that can support him and his friend. And he comes home and he tells his friend, hey, it's time. It's time for you to go to school. And his friend, all he ever wanted to do was paint. And his friend goes to school, and guess what? Because of the years of hard work with his hands, he was unable to hold a brush and paint like he once could. The hard work had mangled his hands and his fingers. And his dream was over. And it crushed Albrecht, as you can imagine, to know that his friend gave his life's passion and career just so that he could have his. And Albrecht didn't know what to do. He, he came home early one day, and he found his friend in the house praying. And he had his hands like this, praying. And that image never left Albrecht. And he said, listen, the only way that I can show honor to my friend is to paint a painting. And he painted a painting. Carson, put that picture up there. World famous painting. Have you ever seen this? World famous. This is the hands of his friend that gave everything for Albert. He said, it's the only way that I can honor what he's done for me. This painting is about a man praying, but it's more than that. It's about Christian friendship. I'm going to ask the band to come up and get ready. I want us to think about this idea of Christian friendship. Who, who do you have in your circle that you can call to pray for you? Who, who would be willing to call you and ask you to pray for them? Who's in your inner circle? And you may be saying, listen, I don't, I don't have a friend like that. I want you to hear this poem. It said, I went out to find a friend but could not find one there. 
I went out to be a friend, and friends were everywhere. You know what? You may not have a friend like that in your life, but you can be a friend like that for somebody, and what you'll find out is, is when you be a friend, you'll find a friend like that. It's that important. Jesus talks about friendship and love in John chapter 15. This is what he says. He says, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. He says, you are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. See, Jesus Christ is the best friend that we have. When the whole world walks out, Jesus Christ walked in. No matter what you've done, no matter what your failure is, no matter what's been done to you, whatever life has thrown your way, even if you feel all alone, Jesus Christ walks into that and says, I'll be your friend. And, and, and maybe you're sitting here and you're saying, listen, I don't have a friend who's a Christian because I'm not a Christian. The Bible says in Romans 10, 9 and 10 that if we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that, that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. Put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And you'll find a friend in Jesus. One who will never leave you, never forsake you. One who gave his life for you. That's what a true friend is. And maybe you're here and you'd say, listen, I'm a Christian, but I don't have a friend like that. If we as a church could grasp this concept, it will change your life greater than anything you've ever done for, for, for the kingdom of God. And here's what I mean by that. I've been to church all my life since I was negative nine months old. But nothing has transformed my Christian life more than anything as much as walking with a group of men in my life. It's that simple. In this church several years ago, this guy that I really didn't even know, we went to college together, UT, 20,000 students, we were in engineering together. I had seen him a couple of times. I don't know that I ever talked to him in college. And he came to church here, and I was like, man, you look familiar. How did I know you? We, we struck up a friendship right there. And he asked me to join this discipleship group for two years, and it was life-changing. And when that two years was over, I started another group in my home because I felt like it was that important. And for four years, me and a group of guys met together. And it's life-changing, more so than this. And I think this is a big deal, is walking with somebody. Shelly and I came to Pleasant Hill 20 years ago. 20 years ago, right here. And we met Rodney and Don. Not Rodney, that Rodney. We met him in a Sunday school class. A small group and they're in our inner circle and you need somebody like that in your life that you can walk with I promise you it will transform your Christian walk to walk beside men and women and couples in that way more than anything you do so it's important Christian friendship is vital the Christian life is not meant to be lived alone so at the bottom of your sermon notes, there's a link to a form. You'd say, listen, I want to join a group. We'll build a group. I'll show you how to lead a group. It's not rocket science. If I can do it, you can do it. Maybe you want to join a group as a couple. Maybe you want to, it's just a men's group. Maybe it's just a women's group. Maybe it's just mothers. Maybe it's divorced. I don't know what kind of group you want to join. We'll find one. We'll make one for you because I think it's that critical. So that's my challenge to you. Who's in your inner circle? Should you be putting somebody in there that you can walk with? Live life with? Somebody that you can not just call when you have to move, but hey, I need you to pray for me. You need that in your life. So let's stand. Let's worship. I want to challenge you to join a group. It's that important. It will transform your life. It could transform your marriage. It can change everything for you. 
Also, men, I'll give you this challenge. This coming Saturday, we're doing the thing called Secret Church. It's something another church puts on. It's kind of a worldwide thing, but it's an opportunity for men to get together. And you know what happens in that? You're going to learn something. It's going to be intense for about four to five hours. But you may meet somebody that you want to be in a group with. And it's important. So there, there's some information on that as well. There should be a slide. There it is. If you want to be a part of that, see me on the way out. We'll be glad to sign you up. We're going to have some food for that. But let's pray and then we'll worship. God, we come to you today, God, first of all, thankful for Christian friendship. God, I'm thankful for a friend at 17 years old who invited me to go to youth camp that changed my life forever. And God, I'm thankful for friends that I met as teenagers that are still my friends today, that are in my inner circle, that we speak life into each other and that we pray for each other. And God, I'm thankful that you put people like that into my life. And I'm thankful for those groups that I've been in where we walk together and study your word together and pray because those things matter in my life. And God, I pray that other people have that desire too to live a life with people, speaking into each other's lives. God, give us that desire. Help us to find people who will make a difference in our life. Help us to find Barnabases for our life and help us to be Barnabases in the life of others. And God, if there's people here who don't know you, God, I pray that they put their faith and trust in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for listening to this message today brought to you by Refuge Church. Please visit our website for more resources as well as our YouTube channel. Just search for Refuge Church in Lenore City, Tennessee to find us. We hope that this message has helped you find hope in Jesus Christ.